Shakespeare says, then you have forced me to act with arms. And I will bombard and I will destroy your warps and your ears. They negotiated, it's a, still a type of gentleman's war, at least in the early part of the Civil War, that the non combatants in Corpus Christi could evacuate. They were given two days to leave. So the kitchen did not be shelled at non combatants. On the third day, at dawn, on the 16th of August, 1862, what is called the Battle of Corpus Christi, very famous painting in the Corpus Christi Public Library, portrays that how it started. Rachel Holly had in place some Confederate cannons down here on the shore. And where is this? If you've ever been to the Water Street restaurant in Corpus Christi, it's about that level. The Water Street level. In place two cannons there, coming in reserve, and they started exchanging fire as for giving to ships. The Confederates were coming out on the, on the upper end of this. Their guns were very accurate. They put hits on that vessel and that vessel. On the other hand, the Federal sailors were unable to silence these guns. They couldn't knock out that battery. Therefore, if you'll notice over here, this little dark line, Kittred sent ashore a detachment of the United States Marines, bearing a light cannon of a house. And the plan was, land them, move them over here, flank this battery, and disable it with a howitzer. And you can see a shot from the howitzer going boop, 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 right there. So what is Navy gunners going to do? He handed it to the U.S. Marines. In response to that, look at this little line of fellows walking away from the battery heading toward the Marine detachment. That was a group of Confederate infantry. Well, they engaged the Marines, mano a mano, head to head. And their charge forced the Marines to retire back to the Federal fleet and for Kittredge to withdraw the next morning. My two comments on this, a battle is a misnomer. This wasn't even, in my mind, a skirmish. Number two, who came out on the top end? I don't know. The, the Corpus Christi forced the South Pole with a great big. I don't think Kittredge was ready to occupy Corpus Christi, so we'll get it, we'll get it to the South Pole. Kittredge's era ended one month after this battle. In September of 1862, he was captured by the Confederate cavalry while ashore, inspecting something down by far below, and the era ended. How are we doing on time? If we had a time I was going to tell you about, which will be next year, the second assault on Mustang Island, which was the assault on Fort Sims. But I will give you this now a little bit after eight. What time did we start, Craig? Seven thirty? Seven thirty. I'm going to continue on. So I thought we started at seven. We should start then. Let me talk about the second assault on Mustang Island. And I put it up, it wasn't there. But I said, if I have time, I'd like to tell the folks about this. When the Islanders left in 1862, after the, the burning of the homesteads, the, the, the Northerners had one of the island. They came on the island, they took cattle, they took sheep, they established some facilities for, for, for storing the confiscated cotton that they were, that they were uh, catching on southern ships. But after Kittredge was captured in September of 1862, the man that replaced him was not a proficient sailor. He was not a proficient warrior. And in fact, the federal presence in the coastal bend became very weak. It became so weak that in the spring of 1863, the Confederates were able to place artillery close to the Uranus heads to defend the base. To have it never again blockaded. Well, the North heard of this, of course, and realized that that couldn't be. It would have to neutralize this Confederate artillery replacement, which was called Fort Sims. And here was their plan. <clears throat> A large group of federal infantry from uh, the Rio Grande River. There was a, a federal stronghold was to come up the island and neutralize Fort 
Palestinians by invading West Bank, attacking the port, and causing it to surrender. The plan was for a ship to bring the troops up from the Rio Grande River to that point right there, and then follow this right on. The plan was for the troops to get in small boats, come up the west side of the island, and attack the port from the rear. The force guns would be pointing out here toward the enemy's fence. So the plan was attack in an opposite direction of where the guns are pointing. A very reasonable attack. When the federal commander, his name was Lansing, when he reached that point on the evening of the 16th of November, the Corpus Christi gas was too silky again. He couldn't, you couldn't even get a rope up through there. He couldn't wait for it. It almost walked through. There was no way to go. There, he was forced to march his troops starting at night all the way up the island, forced march. They marched on the hard sand, each man carrying about 55 to 65 pounds of equipment. And by dawn, they reached a picket line just south of the fort, which is my little white triangle. At the picket line, Confederate sentries challenged the, 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 uh, the infantry, the Northern infantry, exchanged shots with them and discovered that they were facing, the Confederates were facing a very large group of infantry, 1,500 men. They promptly returned to the fort to report. We are in a deeper grief. At that time, the USS Monongahela, if you've ever been in Pittsburgh or Pennsylvania, you organize that name, that's a river, pulled up opposite Fort Sin and opened fire, a federal warship. So now Fort Sin faced two things, a large infantry assault from the south and a very active and enthusiastic federal warship just offshore with 11-inch guns, big cannon for the so Promptly, Fort Sin surrendered. Struck the flag, 99 men surrendered, and the Union captured nine uh, uh, artillery pieces. Interesting story out there. One of them, of the Confederates, a fellow named Maltby, Captain Maltby, when he was taken to prison, he immediately wrote his brother, who happened to be a general in the Union Army. In the Maltby family, it's a classic brother against brother. And he wrote his, his, his brother and said, uh, what problem for me? I'm now a captain of your country. Help me. And his brother did. His brother got him parole instead of going to the POW camp. And parole means that you can, under an honor system, you can return to your country. So Walter came back to Corpus Christi under the honor system of I will not fight again until there is an exchange of prisoners, until I am told that the equal number of, of northern prisoners had been exchanged for me. And under that northern system, under that other system, more in return. Okay, now, our third Civil War feature on this island. The assault, Fort Sims, and post Francis. When the Union infantry had to make this unprogrammed, unscheduled force march 18 miles, a commander of one of the infantry regiments was grousing to his troops, like, this is really hard. This was a really bad decision by the general to have us do this. We're going to be too tired to fight. We should have simply stayed at the ship there, and the ship should have so Sailors up, up here and to the top of the post of the port. His troops became demoralized. This guy's name was Major John Thompson, and his detachment or his unit was the 20th Iowa Infantry Regiment. Once General Ransom had taken Fort Sims and had surrendered, General Ransom moved his troops away. Matter of fact, he moved them north to take care of another group that was strong up here to the north. I won't, I won't go into detail about that. But he left a garrison on West Bank Island. In other words, you can't let the Confederates come back in and replace so too when we leave. The garrison he left was the 20th Iowa Infantry Regiment. And he said in the archives, they get this privilege because their commander acted in an unmilitary fashion. All right, we're also about the march. 
There could be nothing I think worse than to be stationed on this little stiff of land, starting in November of 1863 and lasting until July of 1864, with nothing to do. Only thing they could do is to go into works and pillage Corpus Christi. They built little, little bus, they built little barracks for us. They needed furniture. They would build Corpus and they would come their furniture. What's the connection between post because that's what the uh, 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 Major Thompson named his garrison, post What's the link between that and their history? <clears throat> Darken it. Their history claims that the number for the original name came from a Civil War barracks. A hypothesis is the number for Darken in the original name which was built in 1886. This is not the original hand model. That original hand burned. <laughs> this is a view about 1911. I don't have a picture of it. That the lung from that came from the federal barracks and post romances. So that hooks in nicely to, to a contemporary piece for this really important icon of post romances. Okay. And folks, that takes care of the Civil War. Must thank you. Thank you and peace and love. He was 
captured. He was judged to be an honorable enemy. And he was paroled. The parole system might suggest Under his honor, he and seven sailors that were captured with him sailed back to a northern port and became inactive as combatants until such time as an equal exchange had been made. He did not get that luxury to re-engage in war. I believe that his parole did end and he did rejoin the Navy in an assignment, but what I have heard, and I've only heard this kind of anecdote from another historian, is that he was court-martialed. Court-martialed. An offense against, I think, that he severely punished a sailor and it was a court-martial offense. So I believe that he left the service under a court-martial. Dr. Zahn, I'm trying to pencil with the site of our 1863. Okay. Somewhere in the late court-martial. Where was that? Do you remember where that was? In the Caribbean somewhere. He was on a similar size ship to the, about 40-man crew or something. Right. 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 The kids were terrible. Let's go back to how I started this. Was it the Dan O'Yankees? Was it the Dan O'Yankees that came and burned down the island? Or was there any reason? Well, if you look at the available articles, and you believe what Kittredge wrote in those articles, then you understand the reason for the assault on West Tampa. Right or wrong? There are the facts. Any more? Is there any record of how effective the blockade was? There is a, from the USS Alton wall, he lists the names of southern ships that he interdicted, captured, or disabled. And that count would be, off the top of my head, probably 10 to 12. So I would have to say yes. And of course, this question of how many ships saw his presence there and didn't even fight. So, I mean, so yes, Kittredge was, he was a very effective commander. There's no question that he got kudos from Admiral Farragut. This is the guy that said, Dan, there will be those full speed ahead. That was his commanding officer. He was in charge of the West Coast of Blockade Squadron. And several times, Farragut sent him praise. So you're doing a great job. Keep it up. Keep it up. He's an effective soldier. Say anything else? Thanks for coming out tonight. You're a storm. Appreciate you.